Well, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Dan Painter. I am the Product uh, Training and Development Manager at Flint and Walling. <clears throat> and sorry about the uh, slight delay uh, this afternoon. I was having some technical difficulties getting uh, the audio to work on my end. Anyway, hopefully, hopefully um, you're hearing me okay and hopefully you've also got uh, a full screen uh, so that you have the visuals. Today's uh, broadcast is uh, centrifugal pumps. Uh, we're going to go through what I would call a virtual teardown. In the winter months, oftentimes in the past, we've had lots and lots of contractors and distributors visit our facility uh, for a tour and training. And one of the things that I've done in classroom is walk, uh, particularly irrigation contractors, uh, through a, a, a teardown or a reconditioning of a centrifugal pump. So that's what we're going to do today, try to do it in a virtual way. I'll try to paint some pictures with words and see how this goes. Um, one thing I would say is that there is a tremendous amount of commonality uh, between tearing down a, a centrifugal pump, very similar to what you have up on your screen, or if it were a self-priming lawn sprinkling pump, or if it were a jet pump. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of commonality when we uh, tear into these pumps. So with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I get my uh, laser pointer up here, and we should be able to go. So, you know, when we talk about pumps, we're, you know, there's especially when it comes to troubleshooting, uh, I always try to remind everybody that there's, you know, two sides to every pump. There's the pump side. Uh, some people call it the wet end. Uh, and then there's also the motor. And so if I'm troubleshooting a, a, a pump, I'm going to separate those two uh, from one another to determine whether it's a, a pump problem or whether it's an electrical problem uh, or a motor problem. But with that, we're gonna go ahead and, and talk about uh, how we can recondition these pumps. And I think the best way perhaps to, to start this off is is uh, just let me briefly explain to you how these pumps are assembled. I think knowing how they all go together makes it a whole lot easier to take them apart. So with that said, uh, as you can see, we've got a, a, a centrifugal motor sitting here. And by the way, uh, uh, I guess just as a little F&W plug, Flint Walling's the only pump company in North America that manufactures their own uh, jet and centrifugal motors. We've been doing that for a long, long time. Um, but if you come to our factory, you're able to not only see the pumps manufactured, but you'll see the motors manufactured as well. The back here on this motor is a shaft that sticks out. It's called a rotor shaft. It, it, it's connected to the uh, rotor inside the motor. But that shaft sticks out of the out of the motor. It's threaded on the end, so you can uh, thread an impeller onto it. And the length of that shaft will be uh, dependent upon uh, you know, the type of pump. So that shaft length can vary coming out of there. But nonetheless, uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna bolt a mounting ring up to that motor. And that mounting ring is what's gonna marry the motor up to the pump end of the uh, pump and motor assembly. Uh, so that bolts right up to the motor itself. And then the next thing that goes on is a uh, sh uh, rotational uh, mechanical shaft seal. Uh, we want to make sure we seal that uh, motor shaft as it enters this mounting ring because uh, on this side of the mounting ring, it's all going to be water and pressure. So we want to make sure we get that sealed off where that shaft comes uh, through that mounting ring. And I'm going to circle back on that shaft seal here before we're done today. Uh, we're also going to put a gasket on that uh, mounting ring because that gasket is what's going to seal the mounting ring uh, to the uh, front pump housing. Next thing goes on is a, an impeller. And like I mentioned earlier, that impeller simply threads on to the end of that motor shaft. Um, and when we talk about tearing these apart, I'll, I'll, I'll shed a little more light on that. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's not quite as simple as that. It's, getting them on is easy, getting them off, uh, I'll give you some tips there. Uh, but anyway, the impeller uh, threads onto the end of that shaft, and then, of course, the, uh, uh, the suction flange assembly or the pump uh, assembly gets mounted to the front of that, and these four uh, through bolts will now go through this uh, suction flange, through the gasket, and into the motor mount. And when you draw those down, and you draw them down like you would a tire, 
so you kind of go, uh, you know, adjacent each other as you draw that down. That that'll form a nice watertight seal uh, within that whole pump and assembly up there. So that's basically. I mean, if somebody asked me about a centrifugal pump, I'd probably tell them it's one of the most simplest pumps we manufacture uh, here in Kendallville. And the reason behind that is, is pretty much on your screen right now. There's not a lot to these uh, centrifugal pumps. Uh, they are a pump. Uh, we do manufacture these. Now, what you're looking at on the uh, screen is what would be co called a single stage uh, centrifugal pump, meaning there's just one impeller. And most all the self-priming pumps, most all the jet pumps, uh, this is exactly uh, the configuration you'll see in the form of a single impeller. However, with these centrifugal pumps, we are able to add impellers or stages as we call it. And so if we were going to take this same centrifugal pump here and turn it into a, a multi-stage pump, that could be either a two-stage or a three-stage. Uh, that's a pretty simple process. What we're going to do is we're going to take this suction flange assembly and then we're going to move it on out a little bit. And again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the the uh, length of the shaft coming out of this motor is dependent upon what type of pump we're going to be putting onto it. So obviously, if we're using a multi-stage pump that's going to have uh, two or more of these impellers, we're going to need a longer shaft coming out of that motor. And so that's uh, that's what we would do in this case is that uh, the shaft length uh, would be longer. And then the next thing that happens is we turn this into a two-stage pump is we're gonna take a, a small stainless steel spacer and we're gonna take that stainless steel spacer and we're gonna shove it right over the, as that comes uh, right into that uh, first impeller there. And then once uh, that spacer's in place, then there's what's called an intermediate stage uh, or an intermediate segment. Uh, this is gonna be a cast iron casting um, and it's also acts as a diffuser. So uh, just like uh, in the front of this pump, uh, there's a diffuser built into the cast iron. That diffuser is what takes the velocity of that water created by that impeller and converts it to pressure. And so uh, we're going to put an intermediate stage on there, <coughs> excuse me, uh, followed by a second impeller. So we'll thread that impeller on. And once we have that impeller threaded on, then the uh, uh, We'll put one more gasket on there and then the suction flange bolts down. So it's if we wanted to make this a three-stage pump, we would repeat exactly what I told you. We'd throw another spacer on and then another intermediate segment with a third impeller and a third gasket. So uh, these pumps are pretty simple in, in, in uh, their assembly, uh, the process, so on and so forth. So now what we're going to do, we're going to switch gears. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, and when I'm in classroom, by the way, when I'm in the training center, this is an exercise that I run the attendees through. We'll all take a pump apart, replace the shaft seal, replace the gaskets, clean up the impellers, put it back together, and, and uh, we all go through that together. And I remind everybody that here in the classroom, these pumps are going to come apart a heck of a lot easier than perhaps the one you're going to have to take apart that's been in service for a few years. And so uh, with that, let's talk about the, uh, the disassembly of the pump. Uh, so this suction flange up front, let's talk about a couple no-brainers up front, okay? So if you're going to disassemble and repair a, a jet pump, a centrifugal pump, or a lawn sprinkling pump, uh, I guess just as a CYA on my part, obviously the first thing we're going to do is we're going to want to kill the power to the pump motor. So we don't want any electric going to the pump. Uh, as we're out there trying to work on that thing. So we're going to shut the power off to the pump itself. If the pump is under pressure, we're going to have to release that pressure. And that's easy to do. Uh, you go find a valve that you can open up. If the pump's got no power to it, it isn't going to come on. And so as you open up a valve, uh, that should uh, release the pressure, uh, the water pressure on the inside of the pump. Now we're ready to take it apart. No electric and no pressure on the inside. I would, uh, I would strongly recommend that when you do take these, uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to take these four cover bolts or these through bolts. It's a 9 16 wrench. You can use a socket. You can use a box end wrench, kind of like that. Uh, but the one thing I would uh, caution you on is when you take this front flange off, all right, 
you've got it off. And at some point after you've replaced the shaft seal and the gaskets and so on, you're going to reassemble this. Uh, please understand that front flange can go on in four different directions. It'll fit all four. Only three of them, uh, three of them are wrong. One's right. And the way that I would uh, caution you is, is look at the drain plug. It's in this front um, pump casting. There's a drain plug down at the bottom. I've got my cursor on it. So obviously when this all goes back together, uh, we're going to want that drain plug to be down at the bottom, not off to, at the three o'clock position or worse yet at, at 12 o'clock high. So uh, the drain plug always goes to the bottom. But just, you know, take take a little time to, to let that register so that once you do get it back together, um, you've got it oriented properly. All right, so we're going to take those uh, four cover bolts loose. Now, in reality, uh, you're probably going to want to have a rubber mallet around. Now, in my classroom, these these pieces come apart pretty easy. But this pump's been in service for a while. Uh, a lot of times, these are pumping lake water or uh, surface water of some type. Anyway, you get you get some corrosion that will build up depending upon the water quality. So you may have to take a a, a, a rubber mallet and bang this uh, flange loose, you have to break it loose from this gasket that's uh, actually holding this flange to either the intermediate segment or it's holding this flange back here on the motor mount, depending on the number of impellers again. But you're probably going to have to bang that to get it loose, so don't be uh, bashful about doing that. And of course, once you do break these uh, castings loose, uh, take an, uh, a a blade of some type, you want to make sure that you get all the gasket residual gasket material off these castings. Uh, we're going to replace those gaskets, so I'm not worried about if they come off in two or three pieces. I just want to make sure that this casting's clean of gasket material and this one here as well, uh, so I've got good sealing surfaces when I uh, replace the, uh, the pump castings. Now that same uh, box end wrench. Uh, I told you a little bit ago that when we're taking these impellers off, that same box end wrench you can uh, that you use to break the uh, cover bolts loose, you can go back in that little area there where that uh, rotor shaft comes out of the motor and into the mounting bracket, it will have a flat spot on that shaft so that you can put your box end wrench or your combination wrench, you can put it over that flat spot so that as you're rotating that impeller off the shaft, the shaft's not spinning on you. Uh, so uh, these pumps will come a, a couple different ways. That's one way uh, where you would have a, a, um, a flat spot on the shaft back here that you can grasp. If this, uh, in, in some of our other configurations, uh, there is no place back here to be able to get to the motor shaft, but what we do in those is on the end of the, the motor shaft, we put a, a hex, or I mean a, a flat, for a flat bladed screwdriver. So you can put your screwdriver right on the end of the, the shaft and get the impeller off that way. And again, in my classroom, these things spin off and they spin back on. But I tell the, the people, I said, look, in, in reality, you know, you're going to need to uh, require some tools to get those uh, to come apart. And, and speaking of that, uh, when taking these impellers off, we uh, strongly recommend the use of a strap wrench. Uh, with these centrifugal pumps and many pumps that we manufacture, you have a choice between a, a, uh, a thermal plastic injection molded impeller or you can get a cast brass impeller. Uh, but in either case, uh, you want to, impellers oftentimes can be cleaned up and reused. Uh, and if that's the intent, you, you do not want to get them all boogered up as you're taking them off. And so a strap wrench that will go around the impeller is a much safer way to take that impeller off and, and have it uh, have no in, uh, integral damage done to it. Uh, but I've seen occasions where guys will take channel locks or pipe wrenches and they'll put it on the eye of these impellers and they'll take it off that way. If you distort that eye, you just change the performance of that pump. So you want to be very careful if you uh, are going to take them apart. Um, like I said, I, I use a strap wrench in the classroom. It's, it, it grabs the outside of this. It doesn't damage it. It works on the plastic, works on the bronze either way. Uh, but that's, that's going to be recommended. Once you get those impellers off, and as I mentioned, you can get either thermal injection molded plastic like the one I have my uh, cursor on. By the way, our own company 
uh, outfit by the name of Lincoln Industries located in southern Indiana. They're the ones that manufacture most all the plastic components uh, that go into a, a flint and walling pump. Uh, you can also get a bronze impeller. I'll tell you that these bronze impellers, we, uh, as, a, as a manufacturer, we balance every one of those. 100%, so no bronze impeller comes through our facility and out the door in, in a pump or as a replacement part that hasn't been balanced uh, so that that impeller runs uh, smooth. But when you got the impellers off, all basically we're gonna make, you know, if we didn't damage the impellers getting them off, they can be cleaned up and reused. So you're gonna wanna make sure the eye of the impeller is free of debris. Uh, I've got my cursor on the eyes and then uh, perhaps with a uh, piece of copper wire or a small bladed screwdriver, you can kind of go up into those veins, as you see here, go up into those veins just to make sure you've got nothing uh, 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 clogged up in the, uh, the impeller veins. And so uh, once you're convinced that you've got this all free and open and water uh, comes in and out these veins and everything seems to flow fine, uh, like I said, oftentimes these impellers can be uh, cleaned up and reused. While you've got the impeller out, you want to look for some excessive wear damage. And, um, you know, it's not real common you're going to see that with an F&W. And I'm not throwing lip service at you. But what I am going to tell you is that that motor, as I mentioned earlier, that we manufacture that run these pumps, uh, that rotor that's in that motor is, is not only balanced, but there's two self-lubricating oversized stainless steel ball bearings in the front and back of that motor. And then, as I mentioned, also, we balance these impellers. Uh, so therefore, it's a very smooth, quiet, long-running machine. We don't get a lot of excessive wear or damage. But in cases where you get uh, heat rise or sand or something like that, here's some competitive views. Uh, these aren't our impellers. But just to let you know, if, you're, if your impellers, are, if they, the tolerances are too tight, if the tolerances of that impeller are too tight, and you start to have to deal with sand or abrasives, you can see what kind of damage can result from that. Uh, the, the sand and abrasives have no other choice but to erode material off and away from that impeller. If you get excessive heat rise due to deadheading or run dries, so I'll tell you what, that flint and walling centrifugal will run dry for four hours. I've had it in the classroom for two hours and nobody even knew it was running until we got all done and I said, by the way, this pump sitting up here behind me has been running the whole two hours we've been in here. Nobody believes it. But when they come up to it, I tell them, I said, go ahead and touch it. No, I don't want to touch it. And I said, no, it's not going to burn you. It's warm. It's warm to the touch, but it's it's not. There's Our components are designed to take heat. Um, and so we don't have some of the issues that we see uh, with heat-related uh, conditions like running dry or deadheading. So anyway, uh, replacing that mechanical shaft seal. That's all the way in the back. I uh, want to talk about that just a little bit. So whether you have to take one stage off or two or three stages off, eventually you're going to get all the way back to the motor bracket, and that's where this mechanical uh, shaft seal is located. So I want to talk about that a little bit because that's probably one of the more common replacement parts of a centrifugal pump. If this shaft seal is, is, is no longer in service or is not doing what it's supposed to do, uh, seal being a key word here, then you will get water dripping out of the back uh, between the uh, motor mount and the motor itself. You'll see water dripping out of the back around that shaft where it comes through because that seal has broke free and it no, is no longer providing that seal. Um, I'll take a moment to tell you that every one of these uh, pumps that we build uh, in Kendallville, every one of these flint walling pumps, and I hope this registers with some of you, but we use a silicon carbide uh, rotary shaft seal. That is a standard shaft seal in every one of these uh, above ground pumps that we manufacture. And I bring that up because our competitors don't necessarily use that. They'll use a ceramic carbon. It's, it's, uh, silicon carbide is, is twice the price of a ceramic carbon seal. Uh, but we chose the silicon carbide for a couple of, actually several reasons. Number one, um, it takes heat a lot better than the ceramic carbon. The ceramic carbon, once it gets hot and cold, it has a tendency to fracture or crack. Uh, it'll also take uh, abrasives, uh, sand and, and abrasives a lot better than the 
counterpart uh, ceramic carbon, and it's also designed to just continue to run and run and run and run and run continuously. So again, we use a silicon carbide shaft seal. I know some of our competitors offer it, but it always seems like it's an upgrade. You got, you know, you got to order it special if you want it that way. We feel strong enough behind this that uh, we make it standard. I want to talk about this shaft seal when it comes time to replace it. I've not only looked at our instruction manual, I've looked at most all other pump companies' instruction manuals, and it's a bit of a pain in the butt, quite frankly, in, in my opinion, uh, to get that shaft seal out. So let me let me talk to you about that a little bit. Um, first of all, uh, there's a cavity that's built back in, in, into this motor mount. So it's uh, it's a cavity that sits back there. And the first thing that goes into that cavity this seal's got uh, basically three components. You've got two face seals here that I'm bouncing my cursor back and forth on, and then you've got the spring up above. But this uh, this face seal over here on the right-hand side, uh, to best describe that to you, this silicon carbide sits down into what looks like, uh, to give you the best uh, visual, it's, it looks like a, a little rubber tire uh, from a model car. Okay, so that sits down into a rubber tire. Well, that little rubber seal there on the outside of that silicon carbide has to push back into that cavity. So once uh, you get the old seal out, you want to make sure that you clean that cavity up a little bit, maybe a wire brush or something to get in there and just any any uh, corrosion that might have built up back there or uh, just, uh, I guess corrosion is probably the best word. You just want to clean that up a little bit uh, before you put this new uh, new seal in. Uh, to get that old seal out, and here's where, you know, I, like I said, I've, I've looked at all these instruction manuals, and most of them, we're not exclusive, most all of them tell you to get a couple of thin bladed screwdrivers because you got to pry that out of that cavity. So you got to get a couple thin bladed screwdrivers and go down around that that rubber portion in an attempt to, to pry that thing out of that cavity. Well, I'm going to just tell you from personal experience, don't, don't think a couple of uh, flat bladed uh, pocket screwdrivers are going to get you there because you, you're not going to get enough leverage on it. I suppose, I suppose if those thin bladed screwdrivers had some decent length on them, some decent length, you could, you could actually get some leverage and, and pop that out. One way that I've done it, and I've done it in classroom, I grab a pair of needle nose pliers and I go back in there and I grab a piece of this rubber and I'll pinch it. I'll pinch it with those needle nose pliers and I'll just yank that thing out of there. I've broke them. I've had them come out in two pieces or three pieces and, and they look at me like, oh, you broke it. <laughs> yeah, I did. And I really don't care because I'm going to replace it. I just didn't want to spend half the afternoon getting it out of there. So uh, I say that a little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, but if you've done this uh, often enough times, you'll come up with your, you know, your best practice to get that uh, out of that cavity. It's it's probably not as tough as I just described it, uh, but I think there's more than one way to skin a cat. And so anyway, I just told you how I do it. I take some needle nose pliers, and I just uh, pinch these, this rubber piece up and, and and get a grip on that and pull it out of there. So again, once we get those uh, that shaft seal out, we just want to make sure that cavity is nice and cleaned up because we're going to put a new one in there. And uh, so just a little brush with a, a, steel, a, a steel brush uh, to clean that up. Now I want to draw your attention to these two surfaces here, these two uh, face seals here on this uh, cartridge seal. Uh, when we ship these, they come in a little bottle looks like a little pill bottle. And there's a warning in there, a warning label. That I'm not sure everybody reads. Uh, but one of the things that we're going to say uh, is to dip the seal in water to lubricate before assembly. So you want that little rubber uh, tire to more easily go back into that cavity. Just take that thing and dunk it down into a, a glass of water and use that as a lubricant. Do not, do not use some type of a, a, a silicone spray or a WD-40 or, or Vaseline or anything. Uh, dip seal in water to lubricate before assembly. Also, it says do not touch these face seals with your fingers. And that's we want to really protect this area. So that's why we're using some caution. I mean, we're, we've just performed major surgery on this pump. 
the way I see it, and we're going to put a new shaft seal in. The last thing I want is to get all done, get this thing reassembled, and I still end up with a daggone leak out the back because I have contaminated these uh, face seals. So don't, do not touch the seal uh, faces with your hands because your hands are going to have oil, grit, grease, uh, grime. You know, you just you want to, we want to keep that very, very, very pristine. The last thing that warning does say says that dust particles or dirt on the faces of this seal injure it permanently. It doesn't say might injure it or may injure it. No, it's pretty pretty straightforward. It will injure it permanently, causing it to leak after assembly. And so I just want to point that out uh, so that we, we, we've got a, a, some idea that, that we do want to make sure that we do not get uh, foreign material on these two surfaces that will come together in the back here uh, for that cartridge seal. Uh, so, so you can see how easy it is sometimes. I mean, you, you, here's a pump that's been taken apart. You can see you've got, you know, it's, it's not like the ones I have in the classroom. My cursor is right on that cavity there, if you can see that cavity. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about in that uh, mounting bracket there, uh, to clean that cavity up a little bit before we go ahead and, and uh, put that seal in there. And of course, you know, with, telling you don't touch it with your fingers. But uh, in fact, you don't even have to get that all the way seated in. Um, let me go back. Let me see if I can get this. Uh, I got to go back to this previous. All right. So uh, once you got that uh, seated into the cavity, just start it even. Uh, don't need to get it pushed all the way in there like we saw in that uh, last image. Uh, the second one will go over the shaft as well, the rotor shaft itself. You've got plenty of space back here uh, to be able to slide that over the, that rotor shaft. And then this spring, this spring will go on the back side of that first impeller right over the hub. The eye is going to face the front of the, the eye of the impeller is going to face the front of the pump. The hub of the impeller is going to face the rear of the, this pump, and that's what that spring is going to go over. And as you tighten down that first impeller, as you bring it down and you start cranking that tight, that spring will apply tension to your shaft seal. And once you've got that impeller on snug and tight, uh, that spring will have already set your shaft seal in the position it's going to need to be in uh, to provide uh, sealing. So uh, dip seal in the water. I want to switch to the back here just real quick. Uh, uh, just to cover a few motor components that are on the back side of this. I'm trying to see what time we are about halfway through the, the hour, and this isn't going to run the full uh, hour today. But I want just want to talk about this motor back here a little bit. Like I mentioned, it's a self-manufactured uh, flint walling motor. Uh, we use a metal cooling fan. We've always used metal cooling fans. We make that fan in our factory. If you were to come, you would see that happen. These are air-cooled motors. And so we want a, a cooling fan in there that can obviously withstand heat rise. Uh, plastic fans have a tendency to soften up if they get too hot. And when that happens, uh, they get distorted and you don't efficiently uh, cool that motor anymore. But on the back side of our motors, and again, whether it's a centrifugal pump or a self-priming pump or a jet pump, uh, there's some components back there you'll, you'll find there, there's a switch. Uh, this switch is what actually, actually is a twofold. Uh, it's a switch on one side. I'll show you a picture here in a second. And it's a terminal block on the other. So that's all your wires are going to hook up to a terminal block that has a switch on the back side. Uh, there's a governor that mounts on the back of the rotor shaft. Uh, there's the shaft coming through the motor into the pump. But on the back of it is a governor uh, that's going to operate that switch. It'll uh, make that switch make and break, make and break, make and break. And of course, there's a capacitor, a start capacitor that sits back there uh, on the back side of that motor as well. Those are those two stainless steel ball bearings I mentioned earlier. Uh, again, these are put on that rotor shaft within this distance of the motor from front to back here. Uh, those are the stainless steel ball bearings. That's the cooling fan, uh, copper stator windings. Uh, our motors are dual voltage motors, um, meaning they can operate off of either 115 or 220, uh, either one. I'll show you in a minute how you change the voltage. That's very, very easy to do. Uh, but one thing I did want to bring up is that where these components are on the back side of the motor, uh, the switch, the governor, the capacitor, so on and so forth, first of all, capacitors 
hate heat. And so just to arbitrarily blow hot air across that capacitor all the time probably would shorten the life of it. And so we put a cover on the back side. And these covers were uh, are by design. A lot of people, when we first came out with this rear motor cover, they thought we had created a rear handle. And uh, I would never uh, recommend that. I've done it, but it's rolling the dice that this cover, this plastic cover is only held on with a couple of uh, stainless steel uh, Phillips screws here. And some of these pumps get a little weighty. And so a guy would grab underneath the front of the pump with one hand and underneath this with the back. other hand, I'm telling you, I, it's not. The reason the cover's designed as it is, is if you look at how we vent our motor, all that air that comes through our motor is venting out the bottom third of the motor, not just arbitrarily blowing dirt and debris and dust and anything else across all these components that we have back here on the top side of the motor. So that cover is really there to protect that uh, those components from that dirt, dust, and debris. Uh, I mentioned that we have uh, dual voltage motors. So when you take this uh, black cover off the back right here, two screws holds that on, that's the terminal block that you're going to be looking at. And uh, it's very, very easy to change the voltage of our motors. Uh, I'm blowing that up a little bit here uh, because I want to show you that, that uh, when I look at this motor right here, just by looking at it, I can already tell you, and only because I know this, that it's wired to 230 volt. How do I know? Well, I see a gray and a red wire on the B terminal. So that tells me it's wired for 230 volt. Like I mentioned, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've known that for a long time. But if somebody asks me, well, how are you going to change that from 230 volt to 115 painter? Well, I'll tell you how I'm going to do it. I'm going to take that gray wire with a pair of needle nose pliers. I'm going to pull it off there and put it over on A. So I'm going to take the gray and move it to the left one terminal. I'm going to take the red and move it to the right one terminal. I got two choices there. I don't care which one we go to, just as long as it goes to the right one terminal and the gray goes to the left one terminal, voila, that is now set up for 115 volt. Like I said, the one on your screen, that's a 230 volt uh, setup right there. And you simply move the red and the gray wires to the uh, adjacent terminals to change it to 115 volt. So pretty easy to do. And I, this is the kind of a drawing that's on the side of the pump. Again, there's that gray and red wire on the B terminal indicating a 230 volt motor. Uh, to, to take this and change it to 115 volt, I'm going to take the gray and put it over on the A terminal like I did here. I'm going to take the red and put it over here on the L2, and I do have a couple choices uh, of terminal spades right there. Either one works, but that's how simple it is to change that uh, voltage on that motor. Uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, looking at the back of the motor again, that terminal block's held on with two cover screws. Right there they are. I'll highlight those for you. But if you were to put a nut driver on those and, and back those out, as I mentioned earlier, on the back side of this terminal block also has a, a, a our, our switch that takes that motor uh, from the start uh, to the run windings. And that switch has a couple of contact points right there. We encase that in a plastic housing, like you see here. Again, this is an area that we want to keep fairly pristine. We don't want a lot of dust or debris going through these contact points that could possibly weld them shut. Uh, if those contacts don't break or they're welded shut, then that motor is going to hang up in the start windings, and you're going to see the amps go through the roof. And so, again, that that those lead or those contacts right down there will open and close. And this governor assembly that sits on the back of the motor, when it's in the idle position, that governor is pushing down on this little rubber boot. Uh, there's that rubber boot in the previous slide. Uh, so the little rubber boot that uh, sits there. That governor is, is in the idle position, the off position, that's how it is. The governor's pressing that boot down and these contacts are making. When that motor powers up, uh, and it doesn't take but just a fraction of a second, uh, that governor will come up, and as that governor comes up, it allows that boot to come up, which breaks that contact right there. And so that's how we take our, our, our uh, motors from start to run windings with the uh, with this uh, switch on the back side, 
and the governor that, that uh, opens and closes. That governor opens up in about four tenths of a second once the motor powers up. So it's very, very quick. Uh, very quickly it comes out of the start windings. Now it's into the run windings. Okay, I think that's pretty much um, the capacitor. Uh, the capacitor sits just behind the terminal block. There's those two cover screws. If you took those two cover screws loose, uh, your switch is right on the back side of this terminal block, and your capacitor would also be freed up as you take these two cover screws loose. Uh, so you're easy to get to that capacitor. One thing I would mention about the capacitor is this little white window that I've got my cursor on. And I'll tell contractors that window there is important. That's kind of a, a litmus test as to whether that capacitor is any good or not. Because if that capacitor, when a capacitor is, is they're designed to vent. And so uh, if that capacitor ever vents, uh, it's done its job. But instead of that little white window being there, you'll see this black, gooey, tarry looking substance coming out of it. That would be an indication that that capacitor is vented. Uh, we need to find out, figure out why it did that, and then obviously replace it. So uh, last couple things I'll speak on, again, when it comes to these uh, motors, um, is the high service factor that we uh, apply to our motors that we manufacture here in Kendallville. For example, this is a CJ101. That's a straight centrifugal pump, very similar to the one we just looked at in a three-quarter horse. Uh, but the service factor is uh, 1.5. And, uh, you know, check this out. It's on all motors. All motors have a service factor. But a lot of our competitors use 1.0 service factors. We use a 1.5. And what you can do with these two numbers is what I've done down below here. If you multiply the horsepower times the service factor, so three-quarter horsepower times 1.5 service factor, uh, the resulting number is a little over a one horsepower motor. In other words, we, we, our motors are robust in design. They've got enough copper windings in that stator uh, that that motor can actually operate, even though it's nameplate rated at three-quarter horse. When you buy it, you just bought a, a, a motor that can really uh, put out a little over one horsepower of oomph behind it. That, that's, uh, quite frankly, that equates uh, to performance as well. So two little troubleshooting charts here. Pump runs, but little or no discharge. Um, well, you know, that's the number one cause is the pump's not primed or lost its prime. Uh, I've got some classes coming up. I know I've got a three-part above-ground class coming up, I think, in this month. Next month, I've got a two-part submersible class. We're going to talk about these kind of things, you know, how to properly prime a pump. Um, so that we know when we leave the job site, we don't have to leave with our fingers crossed. We know that we've got a system that's been properly primed and it's up and running. If those impellers are clogged or partially clogged, obviously that's going to impact uh, the amount of water that can come uh, into and out of that pump. Uh, we talked about checking those impellers once we take the pump apart to free it of any debris. Uh, check for impeller damage. Uh, Again, not often you're going to see that on an F and W, um, but nonetheless, uh, we're there. Uh, do a visual inspection. The pump vibrates or makes a lot of noise. Uh, that's typically something's come out of uh, out of balance, so it could be the possibility that we've lost a bearing. Uh, or again, if an impeller gets damaged, it gets out of balance. Uh, it'll make a lot of noise and, and a lot of vibrating as well. And of course, uh, you know, there's always that uh, infamous cavitation uh, that can be present as well. Uh, pump leaks at the shaft, we know what causes that, right? It's a worn mechanical shaft seal. And we talked about how to properly take one of those and replace it. So uh, that would be that would be your your solution for a pump that's leaking at the shaft. Pump will not start. Obviously, the, the, the no-brainers to start off, make sure we don't have a, a breaker or a fuse that's blown. Um, uh, loose or broken wire, when you're in the back of these pumps, uh, where the motor's at, you take that back plate off, you can, through that bottom third vent area, you can look in and see those windings. And if they're charred, um, you could have an open winding or a shorted motor, but they'll typically uh, give you some 
uh, indication of that um, by charring the, the, uh, the, you can look in and see charred copper windings, uh, motor shorted out. All right, with that, folks, I guess, uh, like I said, I didn't know that this would be uh, one that would run the full hour, but uh, we're 45 minutes or so in. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end this uh, for now. Uh, be aware that in the ensuing weeks, and, and I'm talking about maybe the next couple of weeks, we've had a lot of internal meetings. I want these to be more interactive. I'm standing here and I'm talking to my computer. I can't see you. You can't see me. Uh, you can't ask questions because if I open the phone lines up, it'd be total chaos with background noise. But we are coming up with some platforms that are going to allow us to interact. Uh, so questions and answers can be uh, uh, timely uh, responded to. And then also we're going to provide uh, in the very near future certificates. Uh, some We've gotten inquiries on, from people that want to take these virtual training courses and apply them towards their own. Uh, continuing ed uh, credits uh, in various states. And so that, those are all going to be coming uh, to fruition, I would say, within the next two weeks. So I got a schedule that's running all the way out through the end of March. Um, so uh, check that out. And uh, again, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you joining me today. Uh, be safe out there. And until next time, uh, take care. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. This web conference has now ended.